Jim Howard. Uh, you like. All right. Well, welcome. Sokolov Dimitri. So should I start? Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, in, in this talk, I'd like to use the angiosperm family Chloranthaceae to illustrate the value of phylogenetic methods for placing fossils in the phylogeny of living plants and reconstructing their evolution. <clears throat> Chloranthaceae are obscure today, but were prominent during the early Cretaceous rise of angiosperms. Uh oh. There we go. Can I, I get, uh, all right. <clears throat> this slide shows the last three stages of the early Cretaceous, the Beremian, Aptian, and Albion, and the Cenomanian, the first stage of the late Cretaceous. <clears throat> These on the right are pollen zones in the Potomac group of Maryland and Virginia on the East Coast of the US. I began working on Potomac group pollen as a student in the 1960s, then on leaves in the 1970s with Leo Hickey. We argued that the Cretaceous record provides evidence on the course of early angiosperm evolution and not simply immigration of already diverse taxa from some homeland area as argued by Axelrod and others. <clears throat> Rather than trying uh, to assign fossils to modern taxa, which had led to many errors in the early history of paleobotany, we concentrated on morphological changes through time. First, the pollen record shows the, su the successive appearance of monosulcate pollen, as in gymnosperms, but with angiosperm exine structure, then triculpate pollen, then triculporate and triculporate and triporate, which is the evolutionary sequence inferred by Wodehouse, Bailey, and Taktajan based on comparative studies of living plants. Second, Leo and I argued that there was a similar pattern of diversification through time in the leaf record. Most lower Potomac angiosperm leaves are simple and have curiously irregular uh, venation. But in the upper Potomac, they are jo joined by peltate, lobate, and compound leaf types, which become locally dominant. Since then, uh, there have been major advances that allow us to say more about the systematic relationships of Cretaceous fossils. First was the discovery of fossil flowers preserved as charcoal or lignite, starting with work by Elsamarie Fries, uh, Peter Crane, and coworkers in the 1980s. Most of these are mesofossils in the millimeter size range. Uh, they're extracted from the sediment by disaggregation and sieving and studied with SEM or X-ray microtomography. Flowers, have more characters than pollen or leaves, uh, which has made them the mainstay of angiosperm systematics since Linnaeus. And they often have pollen on the stamens, uh, in the stamens or on the stigmas, so they can be tied in with the pollen record. Second was the development of phylogenetic methods, first using morphological characters, then DNA sequences, which culminated in 1999 with an evolutionary tree of living angiosperms that has remained remarkably stable. At the base are the three Anita lines, Amborella, Nymphiales or water lilies, and Austrobaliales. The remaining 99.9% .9 of angiosperm species uh, form the mesangiosperm clade, which includes magnoliids, <clears throat> monocots, eudicots, with tricolpated derived types of pollen, uh, the floating aquatic plant ceratophyllum, and chloranthaceae, which are the subject of, the, of this talk. Living chloranthaceae consist of four genera 
and about 75 species. Uh, this is Ascarina, which occurs in the South Pacific, including New Zealand and Madagascar. Like all Chloranthaceae, it has opposite leaves, which are fused into a sheath <clears throat> bearing stipules. And they have chloranthoid teeth with three veins that fuse below an apical gland. Uh, these also occur in several of the Anita groups and in basal eudicots. The most striking feature of chloranthaceae is their unusually simple flowers. Some Ascarina species, like this one, have the simplest possible unisexual flowers, which consist of one stamen or one carpal. <clears throat> These things are, are bracts. The carpal contains a single pendant orthotropous ovule. <clears throat> so the micropile uh, points downward. The pollen in, in Ascarina is monosulcate and has reticulate sculpture. Both morphological and molecular phylogenetic analyses give this arrangement of the four genera. <clears throat> Hediosmum from the American tropics in China differs in having a perianth of three small tepals that are fused to the carpal. Sarcandra in the Asian tropics has the simplest possible bisexual flowers consisting of one carpal with one stamen fused to its back. Chloranthus, which is also Asian, has a bizarre three-lobed andresium that's been interpreted as either three fused stamens or one subdivided stamen. The middle lobe has four pollen sacs, like a normal stamen, but the lateral lobes have only two. The first sign that chloranthaceae were important in the early angiosperm record came in 1958, when Cooper uh, described the pollen genus Clavida pollinites from the Bohemian of England and compared it with pollen of Ascarina uh, from New Zealand. In the 1980s, Walker and Walker showed similarities at the EM level, including so-called spinules actually microverici on top of the reticulum, sculpture on the sulcus uh, membrane, and a thick foot layer. <clears throat> At the same time, Gary Upchurch showed that some leaves from the lower Potomac group have chloranthoid teeth and also chloranthaceous cuticle uh, features. This picture was strengthened by studies of measles fossils from the late Cretaceous of Sweden by Crane, Fries, and Peterson, uh, followed by Elsa Marie's student Helena Eklund and Herendine uh, Kripe and Nixon working on material from New Jersey in the East, Eastern US. These fossils, called chloranthostemon, resemble the tripartite andresium of, of chloranthus. The one from New Jersey is almost identical to some living chloranthus species. But in these two, the three parts are free at the base. In all of these, the lateral units have only two pollen sacs, as in modern uh, chloranthus. The first phylogenetic analysis of these fossils, plus three others, was by Eklund, Herendine, and me. This was a morphological parsimony analysis using a matrix of 48 living taxa and 131 characters from all parts of the plant. We analyzed this matrix with the outgroups fixed to the arrangement found in molecular analyses, which was robust already then and is even more so now. The chloranthostemon species uh, form a series of branches 
from the line leading to Chloranthus. The first two uh, branches are the species with the andresium made up of three separate uh, parts, while the ones, the one with lobes fused at the base is sister to the modern uh, genus. We took this as evidence that the lobed andresium originated by fusion of three stamens rather than splitting of one. Most of this talk is based on a project I've been working on since 1998 with Peter Endres uh, in Zurich using a morphological data set that we've compiled for living angiosperms. Most of our results were published in 2014. A review, we reviewed these and additional results in 2018. The ideal approach uh, for such a study might be a combined analysis of morphological and molecular data with only the morphological characters scored in the fossils. But for practical reasons, we've used what's called a molecular scaffold approach. The idea is to analyze a morphological data set of living and fossil taxa with the arrangement of the living taxa fixed to a backbone constraint tree based on published molecular uh, analyses uh, shown here in green. The fossils shown in brown <clears throat> attached to this backbone wherever it's most parsimonious in terms of morphology. In other words, where adding them requires the fewest extra character state changes or steps. An important distinction is whether a given fossil belongs within a particular living clade called the crown group or is attached to its stem lineage. We call these ones stem relatives. In our data set, living angiosperms are represented by the three Anita lines. Magnoliids, in the current strict sense, <clears throat> with four uh, orders, the four genera of Chloranthaceae, uh, ceratophyllum, and basal members of the monocot and eudicot uh, clades. We use two backbone trees because molecular analyses don't agree on the relationships of the five mesangiosperm clades. This tree, which is based on sequences of complete plastid genomes, represents one extreme, where chloranthaceae are the sister group of the magnoliids, and ceratophyllum is the sister group of the eudicots. At the other extreme, analyses of morphology, mitochondrial genes, nuclear genes, and slowly evolving plastid genes indicate that chloranthaceae and ceratophyllum form a clade. Uh, these in blue are their synapomorphies, <clears throat> their morphological synapomorphies. Like chloranthaceae, ceratophyllum has flowers that consist of one stamen or one uh, carpal containing one orthotropous uh, ovule. But female flowers are solitary, not born in inflorescences. Recently, Dmitry Sokolov has argued that the apparent uh, single carpal is actually pseudomonomerous or derived from a syncarpus gynesium. Both backbone trees imply that the simple flowers of ceratophyllum and chloranthaceae are reduced, simplified, since the ancestral angiosperm flower has been reconstructed as multi-parted. Since I've mentioned Clavidopollinites, I'll start with the first mesofossil to be associated with this, with this pollen type. This is Cooperides uh, from the Cenomanian of, of Maryland, <clears throat> described by Peterson et al. in 1991. These are isolated carpels containing one pendant uh, seed, as in Chloranthaceae. And here's pollen uh, from the stigma. However, Cooperides 
has features that would be anomalous in chloranthaceae. First, the seed is anatropous, as in most angiosperms, rather than orthotropous, as in chloranthaceae. Second, the outer epidermis of the seed coat is modified into a palisade exotesta with thick cell walls, which doesn't occur in chloranthaceae, but is typical of nymphiales and ostrobaliales. In our 2014 study, the position of cuparides varied depending on the choice of backbone tree. In all slides like this, I'll mark the branch where it's most parsimonious to attach the fossil with black. Here, I've shown the fossil at its most parsimonious position in magenta. But in other cases, I won't show the fossil itself as a branch. I'll just indicate the branches where it is most parsimonious to attach it. To give an idea of hypotheses that are almost as good, but not quite, I've marked positions that are one step less parsimonious with red, and those that are two steps less parsimonious with yellow. Now with this backbone, where ceratophyllum is sister to the eudicots, the best place for cuparides is related to chloranthaceae, uh, supported by its thick neck sign, but on the stem lineage of chloranthaceae because of its anatropous ovule rather than orthotropous uh, in, the crown, in the crown group. Its best positions within the chloranthaceae are one step worse, indicated with the red. This is because the ovule would have to reverse from orthotropous to anatropous, or else orthotropous would have to arise twice. However, the backbone in which ceratophyllum and chloranthaceae uh, form a clade, in this, ba in this uh, uh, backbone, cuparides has four equally parsimonious positions. Two of them are located in chloranthaceae, nested within the family. One is sister to ceratophyllum and chloranthaceae, and one is down here on the stem lineage of mesangiosperms as a whole. And it's only one step worse to associate cuparides with Yanita lines that have a palisade exotesta. So until we know more about cuparides, I don't think we can accept it as a definite record of chloranthaceae. However, in a few minutes, I'll show you another mesofossil with the similar clavidopollinites pollen that does look chloranthaceous. Now, by contrast, the next fossil is undoubtedly chloranthaceous. This is heady flora, reported uh, from the Albion of Portugal by Fries et al. in 1994, and formally named heady flora in, in, in 2019. It's like the female flowers of heady osmum and consisting of one carpel with three adnate uh, tepals. It has adhering pollen of a type known as Asteropolis in the dispersed pollen record, which looks like Clavidopollinites, but has a four to six armed sulcus. The only living group like this is, is Hediosmum. In the Eklund et al. St study, uh, this fossil, which we call the Asteropolis plant, uh, was associated with Hediosmum in six most parsimonious uh, positions marked in green here. It could either be on the stem lineage of Hediosmum or in this clade near the base of the crown group. It was excluded from this large clade, the genus subgenus Tefala, because it lacks a fleshy bract that surrounds the, the carpal <clears throat> and the whole flower. Then the nested positions seem unlikely because molecular dating analyses say that the crown group of Hediosmum 
is much younger than its stem lineage back in the early Cretaceous, uh, namely uh, Oligocene. Our 19, uh, 2014 analysis uh, confirmed that the Astropolis plant is related to Hediosmum. It's associated with Chloranthaceae as a whole by numerous synapomorphies and with Hediosmum specifically by its branched sulcus. Now, since this analysis treated Hediosmum as a single taxon, it didn't say whether the fossil was on the stem lineage of Hediosmum or in the crown group. However, in 2019, uh, Fries et al. found evidence for a stem position in the seed coat anatomy of Hediflora. Hediosmum has no differentiated cell layers uh, in the seed coat, but in the other living genera of Chloranthaceae, the inner epidermis of the outer integument is modified into what's called an, an endoreticulate endotesta. However, Hediflora does have such a layer, suggesting that it branched off from the stem lineage of Hediosmum before the loss of the endoreticulate endotesta. <clears throat> the similar evidence from fossil uh, staminate uh, structures related to Hediosmum. This is a spike of stamens that probably represent whole highly reduced flowers uh, as in modern Hediosmum. There's no pollen in this um, specimen, presumably, presumably because it was immature, but there are small groups of stamens that do contain pollen. This one has a sulcus with four branches in some specimens <coughs> as an astropolis, but three branches uh, in others, <clears throat> a condition that's called trichotomo sulcate. This situation was clarified by the discovery by Mario Mendes in Portugal of this spike, which contains pollen described last year in a paper with Maria Teclava as the first author. Uh, this pollen is smaller than astropolis, and it's usually trichotomosulcate. The three arms are clearest in this grain, uh, then in these light microscopic uh, photos. And here under SEM, uh, you can trace the arms of the sulcus by looking for the verici on the, uh, on the sulcus membrane. This suggests there was a trend in the stem lineage of Hediosmum uh, from a simple sulcus to one with three branches and then one with four. So our fossil would have diverged well below the crown group of Hediosmum. The next fossil from Portugal, Canridia, is significant as a stem relative of the whole family Chloranthaceae. And it confirms the hypothesis that their simple flowers are reduced. Not only does it have several tepals fused to the ovary, <clears throat> as in Hediosmum, but it's also bisexual with the scars of several stamens and a unilocular ovary consisting of two to four uh, carpels. The pollen is monosulcate and reticulate, but it differs from the other pollen that we've seen in lacking spinules on the reticulate. <laughs> Uh, Friesen Peterson and Peter and I both did analyses that attach Canridia uh, to the stem lineage of Chloranthaceae or of Chloranthaceae plus ceratophyllum if the two modern groups uh, form a clade. So this clarifies the, the course of floral reduction. Uh, first, the pedicel was lost and the flower became sessile. And then the perianth was reduced to one whorl. Uh, the outer parts were fused to the ovary and the ov ovule became orthotropous. Second, 
in this crown group. The flowers became unisexual and the stamens and carpels were reduced to one each. The unilocular uh, ovary may be consistent with Dimitri Sosomon's hypothesis that chloranthaceae and ceratophyllum are pseudomonomerous. If the ovule number was reduced to one, this gynesium might look like a single uniovulate uh, carpal. The next Portuguese fossil, Canridiopsis, is the one I mentioned as having pollen of the Clavidopollinites type, in addition to uh, Cooperites. It's bisexual with the scars of three stamens on one side of the carpal. Fries et al. and Peter and I did analyses that attached Canridiopsis <clears throat> on the, to the line leading to Sarcandra and Chloranthus. <clears throat> One reason that it's below uh, the two genera is the fact that it has spinules uh, on the tectum, which are lost in Sarcandra and, and, Chlor and Chloranthus. By having the stamens on one side of the carpal, it's like Sarcandra and Chloranthus, while the fact that the stamens are separate supports the idea that the three-lobed andresium of Chlor Chloranthus arose by fusion of three stamens. The position of this next fossil, Latcocarpus, from the Cenomanian of, of Bohemia is less clear. It's known as spikes of female flowers with adhering uh, pollen. It's like Canridia and Hediosmum in having a vestigial uh, perianth, but it's more like Canridia in lacking spinules uh, on the reticulum of the pollen. This is a case where considering more than one fossil in, in an analysis can make a difference. With the backbone tree where chloranthaceae and ceratophyllum are separated, Zlatkocarpus can be either in crown group chloranthaceae or on their stem lineage. However, if all the fossils I've discussed are included, Zlatkocarpus attaches below chloranthaceae. <clears throat> and this is true with both backbone trees, including the one with ceratophyllum uh, uh, here. With Canridia, Canridia at the base, the smooth muri in Zlatkocarpus and Canridia are homologous, and the remaining groups are united by the origin of spinules. The next fossils are significant because they show evidence of a relationship to both chloranthaceae and ceratophyllum, which may support the idea that the two living groups are related you know, to each other. This fossil, which we call the penny pollus plant, produced monosulcate pollen with an unusually coarse and loose uh, reticulum known as penny pollus. This pollen was a mystery for a long time after it was described from the Potomac group in 1963. In 2000, Fries et al. associated it with uniovulate carpels and spikes of male flowers that consist of one stamen uh, each. Notice it has spinules on top of the reticulum, like Hediosmum, Ascarina, and Canridiopsis, but not Canridia and Zlatkocarpus. And it has a thick neck sign, typical of Chloranthaceae. A bizarre feature is that there are no columella below the reticulum, just a very thin layer of granules. Free said, I'll argue that this fossil was a monocot, since some monocots like Aponogeton uh, here have a reticulum with spinules on top and granules uh, underneath. 
However, our analyses say that it's sister to chloranthaceae and ceratophyllum when the two groups are related and to chloranthaceae alone if they're not. Its best position in the monocots with aponogeton over here is eight steps worse, which is really bad. Now things get more interesting when all five fossils I've discussed so far are added to the tree in which chloranthaceae and ceratophyllum uh, form a clade. This gives two most parsimonious trees, both with Canridia and Zlatkocarpus at the base. Most interestingly, in one of the two trees, Penny Paul, the Pennypolis plant is linked with ceratophyllum. So I would dearly love to see vegetative parts of this plant. Uh, Peter Crane once told me, if you've got flowers, who needs leaves? But finding leaves of this plant could be decisive in placing them in the phylogeny. <clears throat> this is Apometoxia from the Albion of Virginia. It had spiny fruits with one orthotropous seed and pollen of the two canopolis type, which is like Clavidopollinites in practically all respects, except that it has a continuous tectum rather than a reticulate uh, one. <coughs> Parisa et al thought Apometoxia was related to Piperales. But when we added it, when we added it to both backbone trees, it went way down to near the base of the angiosperms, uh, near Amborella, uh, which has similarities in the pollen and in having uh, a single uh, orthotropous ovule. But when we added the other fossils, one of its most parsimonious positions is with, uh, is with ceratophyllum and the pennypolis plant. By contrast, we have al almost all parts of this next plant. This is Pseudoastrophyllites from the Cenomanian of Bohemia, which Yerji Kvacek and Bernard and Veronique Gomez have been studying uh, for some time. For this paper in 2016, uh, Maria, Peter, and I joined them to work on the pollen and to do phylogenetic analyses. Based on its occurrence in estuarine uh, sediments and its morphology, it, Pseudophenolopsis, I mean, Pseudoastrophyllites appears to be a halophyte. It's like chloranthaceae and having opposite leaves, but they're tiny, a few millimeters, linear and apparently succulent. The stamens contain pollen that's like tucanopolis, more or less, as in apomatoxia, but it has a much thicker, more elaborate sexine, outer exine layer. Again, the carpels have a single orthotropous seed, which is removed from one carpel um, uh, here. <clears throat> However, in this case, we do know how the parts were born. The stamens are in spikes, as in both chloranthaceae and ceratophyllum, but they're subtended by bracts, which are absent in ceratophyllum. <clears throat> However, the carpels are like those of ceratophyllum in being solitary, not in spikes or signs. <clears throat> With the backbone tree in which chloranthaceae and ceratophyllum are separated, the most parsimonious position of pseudoastrophyllites is sister to chloranthaceae. But a position with ceratophyllum is only one step worse. By contrast, when chloranthaceae and ceratophyllum are assumed to form a clade, the fossil is, is sister to ceratophyllum, uh, supported by the solitary female uh, flower <clears throat> and the absence of these features that are synapomorphies of chloranthaceae. Similarly, when we add 
Pseudoastrophyllites with these other fossils. It's on the line to Ceratophyllum in two of the three shortest trees. And in this case, uh, it's there with the penny polis uh, plant. Pseudoastrophyllites may be part of a larger group. Uh, this slide shows Montsecchia from older lake sediments in Spain, which is somewhat like Pseudoastrophyllites, but even more delicate and presumably, uh, presumably uh, fully aquatic. Uh, the female flowers consist of a carpal with one orthotropous ovule. Uh, Gomez et al did a phylogenetic analysis that associated uh, Montsecchia with ceratophyllum. This slide summarizes what all these analyses apply, imply about floral evolution. I've reconstructed the common ancestor by using parsimony to estimate character states at this node. In a few cases, the state is ambiguous. It could be one or the other. I'll come back to this. First, the flowers became unisexual and the carpal number was reduced to one. Because the, <coughs> because the male structures of Zlatko carpus aren't known, we don't know where stamen number was reduced. Could have been here or, or up here. Second, the perianth was lost on the line leading to ceratophyllum and in, and in chloranthaceae after the divergence of hediosmum. And third, bisexual flowers reappeared on the line to Canridiopsis, Sarcandra, and Chloranthus, which is rather a surprise. Now here, I've shown the common ancestor as having free unfused carpels, which became fused in Canridia. However, where the fusion occurred is actually ambiguous. It could have occurred down here on the, on the stem of the whole group. As I mentioned, mentioned, Sokolov has argued that this ancestor had a syncarpus gynesium with one ovule per carpal, and ceratophyllum and chloranthaceae are pseudomonomerous. Instead of reduction of several carpals to one, there was reduction to one from several ovules per gynesium to one. Next, I'd like to describe uh, some work I've done with Luis Miguel Sender and others on chloranthaceous leaves from the Albion of Spain uh, near Saragossa. This suggests that a phylogenetic approach can be useful when dealing with leaves, even though they have far fewer characters than flowers. The results parallel what we saw with the flowers, besides showing that the typical vegetative morphology of chloranthaceae had evolved by the Albion. I'll show two of our three leaf types. We have only two specimens of the, of the third one. This leaf type, Tosiophyllum, is larger and more elongate than the other uh, two. Unfortunately, these are impressions, so we have no cuticle characters. The secondary venation here is semicraspedodromas with secondaries that send branches of the same thickness uh, into the teeth, as in uh, Sarcandra and Chloranthus. By contrast, Ascarina is craspedodromas where the secondaries go directly into the teeth. And you and you and hediosmum is you camp camptodromus with secondaries that usually curve upward without forming discrete loops. The fossil has typical chloranthoid teeth with the three veins and a glandular cap. And they tend to be concave on the apical side and convex on the lower uh, uh, basal uh, side. This is the most common type of chloranthoid tooth in chloranthaceae uh, today. 
Now for our analysis of the leaves, we use the old Eklund et al. data set. Since this has species level sampling and includes more leaf characters, uh, many of which are useful at the family level, uh, but aren't so useful at the scale of, of angiosperms as a whole. And we used a backbone tree based on recent molecular analyses by John et al. A tosiophyllum uh, shown here has just one most parsimonious position, and that's attached to the stem lineage of hediosmum. It shares a high length to width ratio with hediosmum, but it lacks other crown group synapomorphies, namely numerous eucanthodromous secondary veins that curve near the margin. It's only one step worse to put it elsewhere in Chloranthaceae and in Australobaleales, <clears throat> which illustrates the limitations of leaf characters alone. Remember that the Astropolis plant was also a stem relative of Hediosmum. This raises the possibility that Todziophyllum is actually the leaf of the Astropolis plant. Okay, that's really speculative. This fossil, Alkynia, is remarkable because several specimens show leaves attached to, to stems. <coughs> this close-up shows a typical chloranthaceous nodal sheath formed by fusion of the bases of two opposite leaves and what looks like a stipule uh, here, and axillary branches uh, coming out. The teeth are doubly convex, both the apical and basal side, which is the rarest type uh, in living chloranthaceae. This is the most exciting specimen with three inflorescences uh, coming from this axis uh, marked here in uh, these colors. Because we have the counterpart of only half of the specimen and the matrix is rather coarse, it took a lot of work uh, to you know, figure out the morphology of the individual units. And I won't go through the details of how, how that got preserved depending on how the rock uh, you know, split. Uh, these appendages consist of fan-shaped bracts and three parted structures, one, two, three, one, two, three, that we interpret as three stamens of a flower in the axil of a bract. Our analysis of Alkynia shows that its vegetative and inflorescence characters strengthen its relationship to Chloranthaceae. All positions below the stem of Chloranthaceae are three or more steps worse. It has three most parsimonious positions on the stem lineage of Sarcandra uh, plus Chloranthus, with Sarcandra or with uh, Chloranthus. However, all four of the crown genera have synapomorphies, which are shown in green, that tend to exclude Alkynia from these crown living uh, clades. <clears throat> Furthermore, there are only a few species of hediosmum that have symmetrical teeth like Alkynia. This position on the line leading to Sarcandra and Chloranthus is where the mesofossil Canridiopsis attached, which raises the possibility that Alkynia is actually the Canridiopsis plant. So these results confirm the characteristic that the characteristic vegetative and inflorescence features of Chloranthaceae were well established in the Albion, as we predict. But the fossils show character combinations unlike any of the living genera. And phylogenetically, they fall outside the four crown uh, groups. <laughs> So I'd like to finish by considering 
why chloranthaceae were so prominent in the early angiosperm record. They may be overrepresented in the pollen record because they were wind pollinated. But this isn't the whole story, since as you've seen, they're common in the mesofossil record too. Now in the basal Anita grade, Amborella and Australobaleales are adapted to wet, tropical, and warm temperate, disturbed understory habitats. And Taylor Field and others have reconstructed this as the original ecological niche uh, for angiosperms. Now, by contrast, chloranthaceae range from understory, as in this case, to open disturbed habitats. Uh, here's Ascarina on a roadside in New Zealand. And here's Hediosmum in a sunny habitat in Brazil. But here is Chloranthus on a pile of debris behind a temple in South China. So this led field to propose that Chloranthaceae were the first line to break out of the understory niche as colonizing species and to spread over the world. And if Pseudoastrophyllites and Ceratophyllum are also part of this clade, it invaded more diverse niches than we'd ever guess uh, from living Chloranthaceae until they were eventually reduced to their present relic state, uh, presumably due to competition with more derived angiosperms. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions, obviously. Thank you, Jim, for your so comprehensive and beautifully illustrated talk. And thank you uh, for speaking slowly. <laughs> I tried. Yeah, yeah, it was great. <laughs> and um, it's time for questions. And I ask everybody to pronounce your question loudly and slowly, if no, you no. <laughs> can try. Suppose you will. Yeah, so. Mitya, you must have a question. <laughs> yeah, and if you like, you may write it in the chat. <clears throat> oh, chart. If, if, if. Thank you very much, Jim, for this uh, fantastic talk and um, the only question I have is what do you think about our idea of the occurrence of a reduced parents in female flowers of ceratophyllum? Well that's uh, very interesting and I know um, it's been said before did, did Shamraf have is it, you interpret that as an extra carpal or as a perianth part? No Shamrov didn't discuss this structure. Oh, okay. Because because no, no, he thought that 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 it was also more than one carpal, right? Yes, but um, but he didn't discuss oh. this this gland, this gland. All right. Well, I I don't know. You know, uh, you. <laughs> I, I I it it sounds plausible, but I I don't know how to evaluate these tiny structures that appear in development. And that might be something, or they might not be something. I, I don't know. It, it would. I, I think we need better evidence that that uh, ceratophyllum is related to uh, plants that had more than one carpal that could be, or or had a perian. But, but the question. This, this is what this. This is what these results uh, tend to indicate, but um, that they're, they're far from definitive. The question of uh, the parents uh, is. Uh, could be discussed separately from the question of the number of carpels. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and I think uh, it um, the idea of the occurrence of appearance fits well with your phylogeny. That would mean that the perianth wasn't lost uh, totally in the ceratophyllum line. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the really the, uh, the uh, loss of the perianth was something that happened in the in the chloranthaceae but one problem and i see it as a problem for the 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 um the uh, pseudo monomeris hypothesis is that these fossils that appear to be related to ceratophyllum uh, penny polis 
Montsecchia, pseudo asterophyllites, uh, they don't show any obvious sign of being more than one carpal, uh, nor do they show any sign of uh, perianth parts. And this could mean that they represent uh, a side branch that had lost those things, whereas ceratophyllum would be have more of the ancestral uh, condition of having vestiges of these parts. Uh, but I see that as a as a as a problem you know, for the, the pseudo monomerous um, interpretation. I don't know what Peter thinks about this. I was sort of hoping he might be here, but I can't. I don't think he is. <laughs> I don't know if he got an invitation. Okay. Well, any questions? In the meantime, two yeah, not questions but those. explanations. Uh, uh, Two thanks. Excellent talk. Very nice talk. A fine piece of work. And one more uh, question to you in the chat. Could you look at it, Jim? The last one. This one? Uh, the last but one. No. Oh, this? No. Yeah. You didn't mention the occurrence of inferior ovary so far down as Hlantesh. This one. Oh, oh, this, yeah. Let me go back to the whole mm -hmm. thing here, this, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes, um, the group seems to have started out with at least a partially inferior ovary uh, because already in Canridia and in Zlatko Karpas, there's, uh, th there, is, uh, uh, there are these um, tepals or highly reduced tepals that are partway up the ovary wall. And then of course in heady osmum, uh, that's the way they, they are. And in the ones that have no perianth, um, Sarcandra and Chloranthus have the stamen or stamens uh, attached to the back of the carpal, which makes it technically, the ovary technically inferior or half inferior. Um, and what again, and implied that in this line, uh, we'd already got an inferior ovary back before ceratophyllum split from, you know, from chloranthaceae. Yeah, that would imply that in this line, um, syncarpia is quite old. Well, you know, who knows how much farther down the stem lineage it might have originated. We, we have no um, idea. Uh, so that's one of the ways that this whole clade uh, had become quote, advanced uh, compared to the reconstructed ancestral uh, flower of, of angiosperms. Well, we have two more thanks in the chat from Aaron Joshi, their informative talk, and from Bruce Cornett. Thanks you, James and Natalia, for the invitation. You're welcome. Come each other time. Well, more questions. Let's see, I had, I had a, what did I want to say? I wanted to say something more about this inferior ovary business, but I, uh, I'm trying to think about, I, it slips my mind now. I, I get off on one line of. <laughs> well, in fact, I, I have a small question. Um, I wonder this glandular caps on leaves and this uh, spinules on the surface of the pollen, are these that unique to be, no. to be no. used? To define yeah. that it's our... No, yeah. No. Well, the chloranthoid teeth, uh, for instance, uh, with the gland and with the three veins, or sometimes it's two veins uh, that connect below the gland, that may be ancestral in angiosperms as a whole, uh, because a somewhat reduced version of, the, of that occurs in Amborella, and then it occurs in Trimenia in the Astrobaleales, and in, uh, and in uh, Skysandra. And it also occurs in some, in the basal groups of eudicots uh, in many uh, ranunculales, you have the chloranthoid teeth. So chloranthoid teeth are not diagnostic of chloranthaceae, but all chloranthaceae have them. And it's just one of many characters that together, um, uh, help indicate where these things might be uh, in the phylogeny. They're not, they're not infallible. 
And the same thing goes with the spinules or microvariche on the um, on the pollen wall. Um, that's not everywhere. It's mostly, but it's mostly restricted to certain groups uh, or within the basal angiosperms. Of course, it appears uh, disappears elsewhere uh, too. So that's one of the one of the um, general aspects of this phylogenetic analysis. It doesn't, doesn't require that every character originate only once. Uh, it's looking at all the characters across the whole morphology of the organism and trying to uh, formulate where, uh, you, how you can best arrange these to make the characters pro most informative, uh, um, most um, indicative of how uh, they were, the groups were, or were related. Um, it would be too good if they were unique. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, some of these, some of these combinations of things like look at Sarcandra, is that weird or not? Mm. I mean, they're very, <laughs> I, maybe, maybe Nietzsche knows of some other group that does that, but I certainly don't. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> Do we have more questions? Go to some more diagrams. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I know um, it takes uh, some practice uh, learning to read these diagrams as well as mm -hmm. to draw them. Uh, there's a so-called tree thinking you hear people say. Mm -hmm. That is not an automatic skill. Mm -hmm. Well, I do not see if anybody wants to ask anything else. Or I have a question. Yeah. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah, now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jean, thanks for your very nice talk. But free is uh, a bit slower. OK, sorry. Yeah. I'll thanks. talk slower. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question. Are there any fossil flower from <laughs> this family uh, from the Cenozoic? Oh, there are pollen grains, uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, and that's an interesting, uh, brings up an interesting point. I was asking whether the Astropolis plant, um, the heady flora, was on this, a branch from the stem lineage of heady osmum, or if it was in the crown group. And I pointed out that the molecular dating analyses that have been done indicates that the crown group, the most recent ancestor of the living species, is quite young, about Oligocene, let's say anyway, early Cenozoic. Um, but we have uh, the evidence of the, the line as a whole back to the early Cretaceous. And that's also supported by the molecular uh, data. But there's actually evidence for a radiation of hediosmum probably the crown group of Hediosmum, uh, starting about the uh, Miocene uh, in the Amazon basin in South America, uh, you get this appearance of Hediosmum. Uh, probably Hediosmum before that um, existed in Central America and the present Antilles uh, region. That's where the most of the basal lines uh, are. And okay. but then it apparently so it came from somewhere and 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 became widespread uh, in the Miocene in the uh, in the Amazon uh, basin. Those pollen grains are a little bit different from uh, living uh, from from from, from the Astropolis type, but they're more like things you find amongst the living species of Hediosma. But as for uh, mesal fossils or um, leaves, could be lost in the <laughs> <coughs> not recognized. Uh, you no, know, they're not that weird or distinctive. Uh, most, okay, most but there are no present. flowers like from the whole Cenozoic from from. No, I, I don't know of any. Oh, actually, there is um, probably, but I don't think it's it's not described yet. I don't know if uh, any picture well, I, from, from the heard... from the Messel site in Germany. Yeah. No, there, there's something that looks like Ascarina. Okay. And male inflorescences with with. Um, the same Clavidopollinites pollen type, but uh, unless I've missed it, that hasn't been described yet. And that's the okay. maybe maybe I'll think of something else, but that's the only one I think of. And that's the uh, 
And they, and I was just also wondering about, they were, you said that they're all wind pollinated, huh? No. And um, we... Hedy Osmum and Ascarina are wind pollinated, but, um, yeah. but Sarcandra and Chloranthus are insect pollinated by small insects like thrips. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. The, the, the Chinese have, uh, have has several papers, Hua, and I forget who else. I have several papers on the pollination of the Sarcandra chloranthus clade. But considering its phylogenetic position, the Sarcandra chloranthus clade uh, may be derived in having insect pollination. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. it may have gone back to insect pollination like the more distant ancestors of the whole line. Okay. And could there maybe potentially have been other insect pollinated uh, you know, in this Cloanthaceae group, in this, back in the Cretaceous? I mean, do we know that they were, they were wind pollinated it, it, or? Well, I would I would bet I would bet that that uh, Canridia, uh, the yeah. one with the several uh, with the several um, stamens and and reduced perianthropods, that that was insect pollinated. It looks like the same general sort of thing as Piperaceae or Sarcandra and Chloranthus. You have well, you have um, <clears throat> these these little uh, sessile flowers that we don't know how they were born, but I would suspect they were born in spikes or thyrses or something. Okay, so there's a potentiality that some of them maybe that we yeah, don't really know about that they maybe also were insect pollinated. Yeah, well, I would suspect they were insect pollinated up through Canridia. Then they went over to at least partial wind pollination mm -hmm. amongst these other groups. Uh, okay. and, and then uh, insect pollination um, reappeared in that Canridiopsis uh, sarcandra chloranthus um, clade. That'd be the simplest hypothesis now but there may be others and there may be some that are that we aren't seeing in the pollen record so much because they were insect pollinated uh, but they should show up in the mesofossil record as they but do we with perhaps the should Canberra. look in amber ah. <laughs> in, <laughs> in insects yeah, yeah it's true okay yeah, I, I don't know they haven't they've never shown up in the burmese um, amber which is sort of earliest right near the Albion Sanamanian boundary. Um, mm -hmm. But by that time, you're getting so many U dicots that um, these, these lo lower groups <laughs> are, are, are getting swamped out. Meantime, we yeah. have. Uh, thanks for asking my questions. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. And thanks for your talk. We have a remark and several questions in the chat. Could you look okay. at it from Alexei Shipunov? Ah. Look in the chat. Uh, he wrote, Kazura, Shizandra, and Delirium, sorry for my Latin, <laughs> are kind of exceptions from the theory of Chlorantalis, which went out of the forests. Perhaps you like to comment on it. Let, let's see, I didn't, quite, I didn't quite follow that. About the ecology? No, it's upper. Um, Kazura, um, <laughs> Shizanda, and Delirium are kind of exception from the theory of Chlorantalis, which went out of the forests. Oh, into more open um, uh, things. Well, um, Skysandra and Elysium and Trimenia and Ostrobelia are all. Uh, either, well, Ostrobelia is a, is a liana in um, the wet uh, subtropical upland floors in, in, Aus in Australia. And uh, Chysandra and uh, Elysium, well, Elysium is a tree, but it's not a big one. And Chysandra is mostly another vine. Um, and these things are all representative of the, the the ecological niche that Taylor Field uh, considers the ancestral one for angiosperms as a whole. Uh, so the, um, I, in the case of the Chloranthaceae, um, Chloranthus and Sarcandra are, are more like that. They are more like the, uh, like the Ostrobelialian uh, niche, um, but Hediosmum and um, Ascarina are more out in more in in open habitats, uh, so that's kind of another interesting ecological thing that it looks as if those two lines 
uh, <clears throat> were had escaped from the ancestral niche, but then Chloranthus and Sarcandra went back into it. I don't know. I'm talking around the question, but because I don't quite understand uh -huh. what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> Alexi, I thought so. Perhaps Alexei asked something else. I don't know. Not sure. I, I'm looking at the people that are on this. Look, one more thanks, one more sorry for mistypes, and a question How widespread are succulent hydrophytes in extant plants? Uh, how, are which? How, how widespread? How widespread are, are succulent hydrophytes in extant plants? So, oh, succular. Okay. Well, the idea of uh, for um, that's for pseudo astrophilites, and I don't know if Yirji is is is, is Yirji, uh, in the audience of this. Anyway, um, and that was based in part on the sedimentological context. Uh, this pseudo astrophilites is really dominant in this particular bed or beds um, in the in the Perutz uh, formation. And the beds themselves are interpreted you know, on geological, sedimentological grounds uh, to be estuarine deposits, so that it was probably a salt marsh type of, of situation. And there, of course, you have things with, with small succulent leaves in many living uh, angiosperms like Salicornia and, 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 and so forth. So that's part, that's, um, that is, um, yeah, that's Yerji's um, interpretation, which you know, it seems reasonable enough to me. Uh, and and it, you know, I don't know if there's any, I can't think of anything that looks quite like pseudo astrophilites, but uh, it, it seems to me that it would be perfectly consistent with that salt marsh type of uh, niche. I mean, we see it also in the conifers like, like pseudo phrenolopsis that I, I started to say when I meant pseudo astrophilites as a, a conifer that has highly reduced leaves and succulent stems. And that was presumably in salt marsh uh, environments in the early Cretaceous. Uh, Han, do you want to ask your question yourself? If I can do so. I also wrote it in chat. Yeah. Ah. Hi, Jim. Uh, Hi. I have been wondering for years and years about the Jurassic uh, Clavati pollinators, pollinators, as you say. Um, do you think that those grains are related to the Cretaceous ones or that they're just uh, similar grains, but no relationships at all? Because I've never seen them really studied in detail. The, the only one, the, are, are you talking about the ones that were described by Hans Trollau? Yep. And there was also some uh, described by and Stan he, Pocock. And, and by uh, Cooper even. Oh, I don't know about that one. But the ones, the ones that were described by Trollau uh, look, based on the photographs, if you look closely, they look as if they have a cycad type um, alveolar structure mm -hmm. rather than a columellar structure. And so um, in other words, it was just... Uh, mistaking a, a cycad or some other gymnosperm yep. uh, for yep. clavidopollinites. And um, was the Pocock one, I think, was the same story. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But I uh, certainly there aren't any, I don't know of any, um, you know, typical clavidopollinites type uh, pollen in the in the Jurassic. We have oh, yes. um, late, late, yeah, Triassic, yeah. late Triassic, there are these crinopolys. I know, that, yeah. Uh, that have a uh, beautiful reticulate tectum with columella yeah. underneath. Yes. But yep. then the index sign looks like a gymnospermous index sign. So either it's some convergent thing or it's something even much more wonderful, which would be a stem <laughs> relative of the angiosperms. <laughs> but um, until we find it in situ, uh, it's guesswork pretty much. So in almost every uh, slide with the dispersed, especially late Jurassic uh, pollen, you find what we say clavati pollinitis type. Really? I, 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 say something like one or two percent. Well, that's a lot. Yep. For these early angiosperms. 
Well, if I, I, I don't know of, of papers that have illustrated these things, or are they just sim simply following Trollow and, and, Ex and identifying even, things that look like his as Clavit Apollonides? Uh, that's, that's what I've been wondering. Yeah. Yes. I, 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 I'm entirely willing to believe there were angiosperms in the late Jurassic. Yep, Although sure. I would uh, I would suspect they were very low in the phylogeny, like these Anita lines. Yep. Um, because otherwise, you know, the, once you get into the mesangiosperms, those things take off and go everywhere. Uh, <laughs> and, and if they were already there in the late Jurassic, why didn't they take off then? Uh, but uh, I don't know of anything that really fits that picture until the Valanginian, uh, where where you do have reticulate uh, columellar monosulcate pollen from Italy and other places. Okay, I will look in, in old literature for uh, for that type of pollen grains. Yeah, I want to see what those are. There, are they all just false clavida pollen ID, ideas? Exactly, are, exactly. Are some real? Because I, I, you know, as I said, it's who knows what the angiosperm line was doing in the Jurassic. Uh, <laughs> I don't believe that it was as diverse as some of the molecular dating analyses say, uh, which say that basically you had the main mesangiosperm lines, monocots, eudicots, already. magnoliids, already back to the early or middle Jurassic, Jurassic because yeah. why, 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 did, why did they just sit there doing nothing? Yeah. Exactly, and don't show up in the, in the, in the fossil record. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I remember there was a paper by David Button who studied um, Jurassic Clavati pollinators with transmission electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was gymnospermose by yeah. Mm -hmm. structure. Yeah, yeah. But if well, I'm not mistaken, I, I, it was um, early Jurassic or perhaps late Dracius in yeah. age. Yeah. They looked like gymnosperm and they were like gymnosperm in sections. Okay, okay, so that was another one. You know, yeah. somebody thought it looked like a clavit of polynides because they mm -hmm. weren't quite sure what a clavit of polynides looked like. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> anyway. Yep. Okay, me. thanks, Jim. Yeah. Well, we have uh, more questions in the chat. Well, and I even suspected some of them are already answered by other people. <laughs> Well, the question from Alexander Timonian, are chloranthus flowers really secondarily bisexual or antodia? Well, that's a good question. And the point I'm making, uh, let me see if I can find the diagram, is that in terms of the phylogeny based on everything else, uh, there are several groups with unisexual flowers, several branches with unisexual flowers uh, between uh, can, uh, Canridia down here and Canridiopsis, uh, where you have the bisexual flowers. So to say that they were bisexual all the way through would require uh, three changes to, um, uh, to uh, um, unisexual that were independent. Uh, we're saying that it went from uh, Unisexual, bisexual to unisexual below Zlatko Karpas, uh, then it would, you would um, you only need two steps. Actually, you need four steps, don't you? So, just in terms of parsimony, that would imply that they're secondarily bisexual. But that's the only basis for saying they're sexually secondarily bisexual. But that's the that's the um, the type of reasoning you can do using um, uh, phylogenetics and tree thinking and so forth. So it's a consequence of the tree, which is based on many characters, and which would actually just love to have, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing that, there's none, there's nothing in the method that says it wants to have uh, these all these monos these unisexual lines between the bisexual ones, but but they're but they're there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Olga Yatsenka writes. Thank you for the interesting talk. Did you have chance to investigate fossil fruits of Chloranthaceae? 
Well, these are mostly, these what, what I refer to as flowers are mostly in the fruit stage. Um, there are, there are, uh, this, is a, this is a question for Elsa Marie Fries <laughs> or Peter Crane. I've never, I've never studied all of these. The only ones of these that I've studied are the Spanish ones and the, um, uh, the Pseudoasterophyllites uh, with, um, with Yuji, uh, and then the pollen back from when I was a mere child. Um, but uh, but um, uh, many of them seem to have had, um, they have a, a slightly wrinkled uh, surface of the fruit of the, of the carpal, uh, suggesting that they were, that they had a fleshy uh, um, mesocarp. Um, and the uh, uh, Fries et al. and, um, and um, Erickson have uh, documented a lot of the, the widespread occurrence of of, of, of fleshy you know, berry type um, uh, fruits uh, um, amongst early Cretaceous angiosperm mesofossils, shall we say. Uh, others, um, for instance, the apomatoxia that I showed with the spines, that's almost surely, almost surely had a dry uh, fruit wall because, because uh, modern uh, fruits that are this burr type um, are, uh, are always dry. Um, none of these seem to have had any dehiscence. And that seems to be uh, a characteristic of most of these early Cretaceous plants. And it's what you would reconstruct as ancestral and angiosperms based on the molecular phylogeny and the distribution of characters on the, on the phylogeny. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> well, a question from Arun Joshi. Which software is better to construct cladistics? <laughs> well, I'm way back in the dark ages. I'm still using pulp from the <laughs> from the last century. Um, this this is just a that's one of the things one could ask is these days, well, phylogenetic analysis started out, well, started out with no computer programs with Hennig and so on. But the first uh, computerized uh, methods of analysis were all based on parsimony, where you're trying to um, minimize the number of character, st character state changes across the whole tree. And that was the mainstay of phylogenetic methods from the late 70s through the, through the 90s. Um, and in some ways, it's kind of simplistic, but in other ways, it's very it's, it's, it, it makes it, it allows you to make a, a, a clear story, which may or may not be correct, and you can have, you can estimate in various ways how likely it is to be correct, and that's why I was showing alternative relationships with those red lines, things, places the fossil might go that are one step less parsimonious. That gives some idea of how strong the results are, and there are methods like bootstrap analysis and, um, and jackknife analysis that also ask how, how statistically um, strong um, the relationships are. But since the late 1990s, uh, there's been a growth of methods that are referred to as model-based methods, uh, maximum likelihood, Bayesian inference, and so forth, that try to, to um, compensate for the fact that when you have long lines in the phylogeny, in other words, where there's nothing branching off from it, from where the line originated to the present day, there's a greater likelihood of change than there is on short lines that maybe just existed for a few million years before they branched and, and so forth. And these take a more probabilistic approach uh, to reconstructing the phylogeny. And um, I haven't, well, I have with um, Mario Coiro, and now in Vienna, I worked on um, on these model-based model Bayesian methods for a seed plant phylogeny, but I haven't tried to do it with this sort of analysis, which is sort of a simple old-fashioned cladistic um, uh, analysis. I, my general impression is that these methods, um, they usually give the same result as parsimony, except when there are very long branches that have undergone a lot of changes and you get so-called long branch attraction and you get the wrong relationships and the model-based um, methods recognize and, and um, reject those uh, uh, kinds of 
attractions. Uh, but when there isn't a lot of that, they give pretty much the same result, except that parsimony usually says it's, it's state zero or it's state one or it's one or the other. Whereas the Bayesian methods were saying, well, it's a 60% chance that it's state zero and then a 40% chance that it's state one at a particular point on the, on the phylogeny. Um, and um, you'll find today that uh, the main place where, or well, the only place really, where people are using parsimony for, for these sorts of things is in paleontology, uh, which, because you're depending entirely on morphology and what you know for the living ones of how they might be related from the molecular data. And the a way of modeling morphological evolution, the ways of modeling it are not so well developed as they are for molecular uh, characters, where we have a lot better idea of how DNA evolves in general, uh, which bases are most likely to change to the other one and so forth. So to get back to that, I'm using pretty old fashioned methods here. Uh, and if you're dealing with living plants and, and molecular uh, data, people would say, you, oh boy, you're really in the last century if you're using parsimony, maybe everybody's using Bayesian. Uh, but in paleontology, we're, we're kind of a backwater, I guess, where um, uh, <laughs> we do this mostly. Well, the next question is by Alexander Kuznetsov, who writes, thank you for the great speech. And the question, how many fossil chlorantaceous genera can hold the backbone with four extant genera? Can what with extant can, genera? Can hold the backbone with four extant genera. Ah. Well, um, is this, I wonder, is this a question of whether the fossils could change the backbone? Yeah, I don't know. Um, the backbone is based on molecular analyses of the living ones. And those, uh, we have very strong statistical uh, tests to say what if this arrangement is right. And in this case, you know, every molecular analysis practically since maybe the someone in the 1990 or so have given the same relationship of um, of the Hediosma mascarina sarcandra chloranthus. So I think we can assume that's right. And none of the fossils would, would really contradict it. Like the Astropolis plant fits nicely on the stem lineage of Hediosma. The Canridiopsis plant fits perfectly on the stem lineage of sarcandra and chloranthus. It isn't like saying it, that the, the line should be arranged, the living line should be arranged uh, differently. However, in the case of ceratophyllum, the molecular data are all over the place. They, they you know, some molecular, some molecular data sets, uh, particularly of the chloroplast uh, genomes, uh, say that ceratophyllum is not related to chloranthaceae. It's related to eudicots. Um, and <clears throat> that among different molecular data sets that, that's going on. What's going on there, we don't really know. Um, if it's um, if it's just too many changes and lots of convergences that just make it hard to see how the uh, ceratophyllum and chloranthaceae and the other mesangiosperms and magnoliids, mnemonicots and eudicots are related to each other, or if there are funny things going on like um, uh, chloroplast captured during hybridization where you end up with the chloroplast from one parent species of the hybrid and the nuclear genes of the other one. Um, we, we, we just don't um, know. And in that case, I think it's interesting that you could, that fossils might tell you uh, which of two uh, arrangements is um, favored. And in this particular case, adding the, the pseudoasterophyllites actually increases the parsimony of the link between ceratophyllum and hediosma in terms of morphology by a couple of steps. Already, the morphology says it's like seven steps or 10 steps, I forget what. Uh, more parsimony is to put ceratophyllum with hediosmum than, than to put ceratophyllum with eudicots. But if you add the fossil uh, at this point, um, the, uh, the strength of the uh, relationship between ceratophyllum and, and chloranthaceae actually increases by a couple of steps. Uh, so it's, instead of being 
seven steps more parsimonious to have serotophyll. Here is nine steps. You know, um, but I don't know whether that would overcome uh, some of the other molecular data. Uh, and back in 2000, when um, Peter Andrews and I first published on this, our morphological data set, we combined it with sequences of the three genes that were most used at that time. And almost always there, the molecular data overwhelmed the morphological data and said when they disagreed. But there were a few cases, there were exceptions, like the relationship of the Loraceae, Hernandiaceae, and um, Onimiaceae in the order uh, Loraceae's. Uh, the morphological data actually said the molecular data were wrong because then the molecular data were very weak uh, in saying how those three were related, whereas the morphological data all went for one alternative. But that was 2000, and now almost no molecular systematists are interested in combining their, morph their molecular data sets with morphological ones to see if something might shift a little bit. Um, I've tried for <laughs> some time to get one of these big data sets uh, that we could add the morphology to, but it's always somebody's you know, third uh, priority, priority, and, and then you know, the other things are, are more than more important to them. Now, one more thanks from Silvia Ulrich, and question from Han. Already, mm -hmm. we discussed it. And a remark from Dmitry Sokolov. Mitya, может, ты хочешь сам его произнести? Да, конечно. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, it is remarkable how male reproductive structures of ceratophyllum and hediosperm are similar. So, as, uh -huh, you, yes. as, as you and Peter so nicely demonstrated in your papers. Uh, but uh, in the framework of those phylogenies, uh, it's uh, yeah. homoplastic. Yeah, exactly. You would have medium. to assume you would have to assume that the bracts, the subtending bracts, were lost before before ceratophyllum branched off, and then they stayed lost in Hediosmum, and then they came back um, in Ascarina and and so forth where there where there are the bracts uh, again so that when that one that one character um uh it it would be uh, more uh, it would be more parsimonious to put ceratophyllum with hediosmum but notice pseudoastrophyllites does have subtending bracts mm -hmm. um so that um uh, below the the stamens so that um, is one little one piece of information that in fact this did happen se uh, separately uh, here. In this tree, actually, I could have said, you know, loss, I could have said loss of subtending bracts, reappearance of subtending bracts, or also I could say that uh, I'd have to say that you had loss of subtending bracts twice. So that would be equally parsimonious. So in terms of that, uh, you couldn't say, but with the pseudo um, astrophyllides with, with subtending bracts, well, that, that breaks the tie. But, uh, apart apart from the loss of uh, subtending bracts uh, in uh, male inflorescences, there is also uh, an involucre. Uh, oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. A very very uh, similar involucre in um, hediosperm yeah. and and yeah. I'm not so. I don't know that so well. Let me see if where where are my pictures. I'll have to go way back before I find the hediosperm. Yeah. Because that was what used to be thought of as the, and some people still think of it as the perianth mm -hmm. of a male flower with many stamens. Uh, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but uh, extant, extant hediosmon has uh, almost the same involucre as, yeah. mm. as, mm, uh, film. as, as, uh, ceratophyllum, yes, just smaller, but morphologically absolutely identical. Yeah. Well, you would expect. You wouldn't be surprised that that would happen if the spikes had become that reduced, that there'd be a few um, philomes, sterile philomes down on the below that on the axis of the inflorescence. But it is that's interesting. Mm -hmm. they, they are those um, uh, structures uh, of the involucres, they are 
uh, fused in a with a schisting base. Oh, really? Um, hmm. Yes. Uh, this, I think I uh, you mentioned this in your recent paper, don't you? I don't. I, I think right. Yes, I haven't. Sir. It's been a while. Yeah. Thank you Florent, very much. Florent Acey and Serato Film, have, they, they, they raise so many morphological questions. It's really a fascinating group to me because I always have sort of a morphologist when I'm not a paleobotanist and systematist or whatever. Do we have more questions to Jim? Or oh, perhaps it was the last one? Okay, it seems that we have finished with the questions. It was, it's getting late there too in Moscow. Isn't it? <laughs> no, it's not that 9 30, right? Not as late as in Vladivostok. <laughs> I know, poor, the poor people in Vladivostok. Uh. <laughs> well, Jim, we, will, we are really happy to have listened to you today. And I'm really, happy. Yeah, I've yes, really, thank I've, you so much. I've really, I really enjoyed talking about these things and having this contact with you with actual faces rather than emails or. Facebook. Yeah, alone. yeah. <laughs> Different things. Yeah. And I'm very happy to see you all. And I, I hope to see you perhaps not the next time, but some of our next times. Yeah. Because the next talk will be in Russian about entomo entomophily. Uh -huh. And the next but one will be in Russian again about fossil. Um, Fossil roots, mm. but the last one in the mid of September, in the mid of December, there will be about angiosperms again by uh, Professor Sungye. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I saw that. So yeah. yeah, you're welcome to join us in the mid of September, in the mid that's, of December. That's very. December. That's, yeah, that's very interesting to me. The relations of the. Um, these Chinese uh, floras um, with the with the Dany Vostok, yeah, those are near Vladivostok. Those are that's an interesting question. I would like to see the answer. Yeah, and I see two more thanks from Arun Josh and from Bruce Cornett mm -hmm. uh, for your very interesting and very informative talk. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all for coming. You're